Stand as you're able.
moment and open our hearts to the presence of the Holy Spirit that is always coming and moving towards us, always loving us, always wanting to convert us to his will and all the things that he has in store for us. Let us make the Holy Spirit, with the Father and the Son, the most important things in our lives as we begin to celebrate this Holy Eucharist and hear God's Holy Word. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be the strength of God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. and prophets, Jesus Christ, himself being the cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple, acceptable to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. First reading is taken from 1 Kings, chapter 19. The Lord said to Elijah, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also, you shall anoint Gesu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha son of Shaphat, of Abel, Ahola, as prophet in your place. So he set out from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Sapha, who was plowing. There were twelve yoke of oxen ahead of him, and he was in with the twelve. Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle over him. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and said, Let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. Then Elijah said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, took the yoke of oxen, and slaughtered them. Using the equipment from the oxen, he boiled their flesh and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out and followed Elijah and became his servant. The word of the Lord. I agree, God. 
The psalm for today is Psalm 16. Please read responsively by half verse. Protect me, O God, for I have taken refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all others. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land. But those who run after other gods their libations of blood I will not offer. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I have set the Lord always before me. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. For you will not abandon me to the grave. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is joy, and in your right hand. The second reading is taken from Galatians chapter 35. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. But through love, become slaves to one another. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. And they were going along the road. Someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes and holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. joy and surprise, but there might also be great difficulty, which may lead us to want to abandon what we have set out to do or to abandon the one that we want to follow. A journey often means that we have to change how we think of things and what we expect or hope to find. Sometimes it requires sacrifice and some pain. I remember a few years ago a friend and I hiked up the tallest mountain in New York State in the Adirondack Mountains. We had hiked several other peaks in the region, and it seemed time to hike the tallest and most challenging mountain in the state. My friend had hiked this particular path to let me know that the ascent was gradual, but that it was very long. But at the end, the views were beautiful, and it would be well worth the journey. When we started out, it was a beautiful October day, Blue skies, autumn colors, seemed to make it the perfect day for a long trip, a long journey up the mountain. And about halfway up, my knee began to give me trouble. So I periodically had to stop and stretch it, and then it would be fine. Then it would happen again. And then we encountered a half a foot of slushy, wet snow about halfway up the mountain. It was melting because it got warm. We continued. I was promised that it would be worth it in the end, and I remained determined to get to the top. But I also remember feeling a sense of purpose wavering, and I asked how important really was it to make it to the top. I trusted my friend, and I looked forward to the views, similar to those that I'd seen from other mountain tops. As we finally approached the top, we were both exhausted, but excited. We got to the top, and with that, rolled in a very thick, thick fog. As thick as pea soup. We couldn't see two feet in front of us, let alone a magnificent view. So there was no promised view, and it was cold, it was wet, and it was windy. But there was still something wonderful and beautiful, almost surreal, about being there on that mountaintop. It was not at all what I expected, but it was what I ended up receiving. And in its way, again, it was very, very beautiful. After we took it all in, we realized that we had a very long journey back to the car, and it was another long journey that required a certain amount of trust, and accepting that it would be hard because my knee would be giving me trouble. 
the more you go down, a mountain, it's, I don't know if anybody knows, but you come down the mountain, it's much harder on your knees than when you go up. And they were already in control. Anyway, going down the mountain was hard. I continued to stretch out knee every 15 minutes. By the time I got back to the car, it was dark. And we were hungry. And we started discussing about the, the, the disappointment about that we didn't get what we had expected. But that we had experienced something different and beautiful in its own way. But now, as I look back at that day and that whole experience, I think of it as a great day. And I'm very grateful. It was a beautiful day. It was a beautiful experience in that alpine, sort of foggy, wintry experience on top of the mountain. In today's Gospel reading, and by the way, I've never gone, gone back on the mountain, I've never seen that view, so <laughs> never felt that need to do that. But in today's Gospel reading, Jesus is on his own journey. He's on a journey to Jerusalem. And he set his face towards the city where he will ultimately live out his passion and his death. He knows the inevitable is coming. He knows that his ministry is not simply about teaching others how to treat each other and about how to get closer to God. He is the Son of God, sent by the Father to restore and redeem the world. That's a tall order, and I would imagine in his human nature, Jesus had doubts as to whether he could follow through and walk the path that he was called to walk. There was much hostility towards him, and there were many disappointments. Last week, we read of Jesus crossing into Gentile territory to minister to Legion and his community. Today, he desires to minister to the Samaritans, a group that's very different from the Jews. Racially and religiously, they're mixed. They're, they're, they're related to Jews, but they're different. Nonetheless, there's a great deal of hostility between the Samaritans and the tradi traditional Jews. In fact, Jesus chose to go this route in particular to be with this group of people. It was not an easy route, it was less direct. But Jesus knows that he's on a mission to serve and to touch the whole world, all of the people, Gentiles and Samaritans and Jews alike. His authority and his forgiveness extends to all people. He meets with the Samaritans, but they turn him away. Was his journey worth it? Looking back, we would say as Christians, it was an essential journey. I love the image that St. Luke paints of Jesus. He is steadfast as he is committed no matter what. He brushes the Samaritans' rejection off. He rebukes the apostles who want violent revenge. Judgment is to be left to God alone. There's no room for violence in his ministry. To be his followers means to let go of certain ideas and to lean into the, that truth that God calls us into. And also to behave and think about things that aren't natural not into our personality. We need to change. He calls us to something often very different from what feels comfortable, to what we want or to what we expect should happen. To be his disciples requires change, it requires trust, it requires commitment. Christ's commitment never wavers, despite being turned away by those he wants to love. He has nowhere to lay his head. He seems to understand that the entire earth and creation and the people he encounters is his home already. Whether they welcome him or not, he is home where his mission is, and food and shelter seem to be secondary. Now this seems very alien to me, it seems alien to most of us. As human beings, we all want a sense of permanence, a sense of home, deep connection. That's what we really crave as human beings. And Jesus' disciples remind us of this today. They want to follow him, but they need to do other things first, like bury the dead and say goodbye to parents or friends. And that sounds fairly reasonable to me. At first, Jesus seems a bit unrealistic and maybe even unkind in his response. And he certainly seems demanding. 
But I think that Jesus' point here is not to be unkind. I think Jesus' point here is to remind those disciples, or would-be disciples, and to remind us here today that committing to him and following him requires an unconditional response. And the more way down we are with things, and the more we're stuck in our own ideas of the way we think things should be, the harder it is to fully open our hearts to him in order to do his mission and to live into his will. As human beings, we tend to need concrete things around us. We need things that help define us and give us a sense of security. So too in our relationships. They also help us feel secure. But we often place conditions on those relationships because of our own inward and inner needs and often demands. This is no different in our relationship with God. Our commitment and openness to God is always being tempted. We get distracted by the hardships of the world around us, and they're pretty hard right now, both in our personal lives and in that big world. We can get distracted by our own wants, our own desires. We can get distracted by not only what we believe, but how we think things should be. And we can actually demand that God sees it the same way. This often moves us in the very opposite direction of where God wants us. God's will and mission is not necessarily our own. Our lives belong to him. To be his disciple requires commitment on so many levels, and this is hard. Let the dead bury the dead. Again, I think Jesus is stressing a point. It requires to leave what is dead behind us, what is useless, leave it behind us. Disappointments, let it go. Let go of the past and shift our focus, shift our heart to the present and to the future. Being a disciple of Jesus means changing how we think, how we behave, and changing our expectations by being open and living into the way we might, might not otherwise live. And that is not easy. As Jesus journeys to Jerusalem, he knows that his earthly ministry is coming to an end. He knows that he must prepare his disciples not only for his imminent death, but to look further out into the future. He needed to prepare those disciples to prepare them to be church, to be his feet and his hands, in order to do his will and continue to bring about his kingdom. It's no different for us here today, but we have an advantage. We know something those early disciples didn't know. We are blessed with the knowledge and the power of Jesus' resurrection and the power of the Pentecost. God leaves us with the proof of eternity and the grace of the Holy Spirit at the Pentecost. Grace is our lifeline, and God calls us to depend on it. But if we're burdened with those attachments and those th uh, thinking the way things should be and certain expectations and we get distracted by all of our wants and desires, and we don't make God first, making room for God and His grace sometimes gets derailed. Now, there's a lot to be said for grace, obviously. It, it is, as I said, it's our lifeline. What is most clear is that whether we feel it or not, it's always present. God keeps coming to us over and over and over, pulling us into his love, pulling us into his will for us, pulling us into his kingdom and into his mission for the world. In today's gospel, there's a definite urgency about Jesus' mission to bring about his kingdom. Jesus stresses this urgency to his disciples. He wants them, and he wants us here today to make bringing about his kingdom our first priority. In the epistle today, St. Paul calls for that reliance on the grace of the Holy Spirit. It's essential if we're going to walk with Jesus. It is only that depending on him and his grace that we can focus on those more important things that bring us closer to him, his will, and his mission for the world. 
In these weeks after Pentecost, let us open our hearts to what the Holy Spirit is calling us to. Jesus directed his life with purpose and didn't yield to any of the distractions of his, this world. He kept his eyes on Jerusalem and on the will and purpose of his Father. As Christians, we're called to commit to being Christ's disciples. And again, this is no easy task in, in this world, but it's essential if we want peace and we want to bring about his kingdom. The great theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, Christianity without the living Christ is inevitably Christianity without discipleship. And Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. The tough words, very tough words, but so true. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in your wisdom, we sometimes neither receive what we want or what we expect. Give us the grace to open ourselves up more fully to you and your will and all that you want to do in our lives and in your church to be true disciples, to spread your word, to make your kingdom a reality. Give us this courage and humility through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives with you and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, let us stand and profess our faith on the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. Eternally God of the Father, God of the Father, life of life, true God of the true God, he God of not made, but only made with the Father, for whom all things were made. For us as for our salvation, he came God down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified on the cross of Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord the giver of life, and proceeds to the Father and the Son, and the Father and the Son be his worship and glorified. He has spoken to the Father. We believe in one holy Catholic Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We love for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we know all that you want. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all we do. We pray for our bishops, Michael and Daniel, and all priests and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of the word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world especially Joseph, our president, and Tom, our governor. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief, trouble, or illness, especially remembering those on our prayer list and any that we'd like to um, announce now in our hearts or verbally. John Zahn, Flossie, yeah. Brian, Brian, Linda, Kelly, Jen, Kelly and Sonny Campanelli, Dan Sefter, John Detweiler, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon you. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to your sharing of heavenly kingdom. 
Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We pray in this world where there is violence, in particular in Ukraine, we pray for an end to that war. We pray, we pray for an end to oppression and violence, the peace of the world. We pray for our environment, that we may have the will and the wisdom to undo the wrongs done by humankind throughout the years. We pray for an end to our political divisions in our own country. We pray for an end to gun violence, violence in our city streets. We pray for this parish, St. John's, that they may find a pastor to bring them into the future, to guide them into the future. Lord, hear the prayers of your people that what we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you, and God, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not left you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and cannot be repent. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. everyone's attention to the announcements. First, we'd like to welcome the Reverend Larry Savelle as our celebrant today, and thank you very much for joining us. Um, St. James Episcopal Church will be having Bible school from July 11th to 14th, from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Um, if anybody needs a registration form, let me know and I can email it to you. That is a list of food pantry needs. Um, and remember, if you have any pastoral emergencies, to call Mary Ann Waters. The elder flowers today are giving in loving honor of John Smith's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Are there any birthdays today? Any anniversaries? Oh, oh anniversary. Do we have a prayer? Yes, we do. Prayers? Help me out here. What's the page? No, I turned right to it. No, we use the same for what? We use the same for birthdays? For, no, that's not the We have a special prayer for on anniversaries, folks? Yeah. Does anybody <laughs> yeah, know what we, page we is just on? Kinda, we kind of just, 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 just do a spontaneous prayer. Father, we ask you to bless these two beautiful people who lived their lives together how many years? 57 years, that's, that's beautiful. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for that commitment and for that love. I'm sure it's not always been a, an easy journey, but as it is with any couple. We ask you, Lord, to bless them and to give them many more years. We thank you for their service and for your love in your church. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, Happy anniversary, Ryan Mary Jane. Is anyone traveling? Any other announcements? Yeah, there's just one uh, change. Um, after that the, uh, sermon, I think I want to change the offertory hymn to 660, O oh, Master, Let Me Walk With You. I think it's 660. Do I hear that? 660? Right. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and give you thanks, for you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in life inaccessible before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise, joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven. We acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to the sorrowful joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, restored death, and made the whole creation new. And if we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of us all. When the hour had come, for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate the memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we praise you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that your goodness and mercy, 
your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be the holy gifts by your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and life. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, the patriarchs and prophets, apostles and martyrs, with St. John and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, and all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Hallelujah, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Amen. Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts with faith, with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us of these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, set us out to do the work you have given us to do.